Welcome back to Martins and More. My name is Mario Rooks. And I'm Spoon Phillips. I'm Dick Polk. <laughs> we are on location today. This is going to be a really great show. Thank you very, very much for having us, Dick Polk. Well, thank you. So Glad to see you, Dick. Dick. Bye, Booker. <laughs> What's going on? It's been so long. We, uh, we've known you forever, but we finally, finally wrangled you into uh, being fooled into being with us on this podcast. Well, it's, it's an honor to be wrangled. I, I follow you guys on... Uh, on social media, of course, and as does everybody that loves guitars. So uh, I'm living, eating, sleeping, breathing guitars all the time. And uh, that's why it's especially nice to talk about it a little bit. You sleep? Mm, more than you'd know. <laughs> so for those who are not that familiar with Dick Boak, for many years, he was the the public face of Martin Guitars, the absolute international goodwill ambassador for Martin Guitars, uh, though those were not his official jobs. And uh, so why don't you uh, quickly, for those who are not that familiar with you, Dick, give us a quick overview of when did you start there? How did you start there? And, and how did you get to where you are now? Well, you've heard, you've probably heard some of these stories before, but I, I, um, I was an art teacher uh, in Blairstown, New Jersey, at a, a small private school called Blair Academy. And my hometown is Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and driving from Bethlehem to Blairstown, I had to go right through the town of Nazareth. And I saw the, the billboard for Martin Guitars. Um, I was interested in guitars from a very early age, as I will show you. And I, I stopped by and uh, took the Martin tour, and I was really blown away by it and and uh, after the tour was over I you know I, I was um, really surprised to see rosewood and ebony and mahogany and spruce woods that I that I was not really familiar with and I asked the receptionist if they had any scrap woods and they they sent me around to the side of the building and uh, I kind of hit the jackpot that day and I filled my car up and I came back to the dumpster probably 500 times <laughs> and and they got to know me at the back door and um, uh, so several years happened before uh, several years of dumpster diving before I actually uh, met Harvey Harvey Samuels was the foreman at the back door and he said uh, uh, in Pennsylvania Dutch accent he said well what do you do with this stuff anyhow and I had uh, a couple of instruments this being one of them. Um, this is um, kind of a mando. You can see that it's made with rosewood. And, and the rosewood was just scrap, not big enough to make a guitar out of. Sure. Same thing with the, the mahogany. Th these were dreadnought guitar sides ah. that had broken on the waist. And this was a, a neck billet that was, had something wrong with it, grains going this way. And, um, and a, a little mahogany back. They, they threw a lot of mahogany aw away. This has had ribbon grain. Um, so I came back to my home and, and uh, turned these pieces on the lathe. This is spruce, mahogany, and, and for the rosette. Um, and um, made these instruments that I call bokestruments. And <laughs> they don't have a lot of uh, volume. Um, I didn't know much of anything, but I love I love the woods and and so I made that. So it's probably smart to uh, show this one as well at this point. This instrument, pr this precedes. This one is, was when I was dumpster diving at Martin, but this instrument precedes Martin by by maybe fifteen years. So I was just a kid. I, I was maybe between 10 and 14 yeah. years old. My dad had a wood shop. Um, this, is, this neck is made out of a two by four. And you can see I didn't know where to put the frets. <laughs> so I drilled holes about every eighth of an inch in order to get the frets more or less where they should go. And, I, and Ravi Shankar was famous with the Beatles and everything, and George was playing the sitar. So this was my attempt at, at building a sitar. See my, my little bridge, <laughs> all the strings are tied to a post. Um, the top has caved in somewhat. 
So yeah. it, it actually has the action of a lot of people's first acoustic guitar <laughs> <laughs> growing up. <laughs> So while you were playing that for Harvey, he turned to somebody and said, that boy is crazy. We want to hire him. But he's a Dutch actor. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I built instruments out of balsa wood from the hobby shop. They, of course, they imploded. I, I built all kinds of things, uh, lathe-turned, banjo-like things. That uh, uh, I built one that was a doorknob guitar that went... <laughs> and... Um, you know, I, I, I just always wanted to build guitars. I, I loved woodworking, and and uh, so it wasn't really until I took the tour at Martin and and uh, discovered the dumpster that I that I learned what the correct materials were for guitars and and uh, a little bit about how the instruments should be made. Wow! Uh, did you say anything like that in the tour, like when you? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, that would have scared them away. So did he tell you to come and apply for a job? Or? He told me to apply for a, a job. A job. <laughs> and uh, I went around and I applied and I had kind of an afro, if you can imagine that. And I was filthy dirty from being in the dumpster and she said, I don't think we have anything for you. And uh, um, turns out they did have a job uh, in drafting and, and I had been teaching drafting for four years and I've been doing drafting for 10 years and mm. and it was just uh, just the uh, right place at the right time with the right set of uh, credentials mm. and they said well could you start tomorrow and, and I said no I have to go to the Bob Dylan concert but I could start on Thursday so, <laughs> right, right. so that was October <laughs> of 1976 wow. uh, uh, they were they were just finishing up the edition of uh, Bicentennial Guitars with the eagle in it and sure. and uh, um, on my first my very first day at work I saw the bill the bulletin board um, employees that wish to order a guitar may do so by by coming to the personnel department well I went at lunchtime I went <laughs> over there and you know uh, day I one. said I, I want to <laughs> buy a guitar <laughs> And I said, who are, who are you? I said, I just started. So um, they gave me the price list, and I said, you, you, you get special employee price. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you the discount, but it was very good. And I didn't have a lot of money. I said, I only have $400. He said, well, we could sell you a tipple. No way. So this is the, the tipple that I bought on my first day at work. That's the one. This is the one, but uh, I didn't like it. I didn't like the arrangement of the strings, which were two, three, three, and two, right? This, the, those triple strings didn't intonate correctly because the middle string was wound and the two, the two adjacent strings oh, were unwound. Okay. When you depress them, the, the wound string went sharp and the others didn't. And, and it just, I didn't like it. So I took the bridge off and I made a, I made a replacement bridge uh, and I turned it into a Basically, a, a five, you know, five pairs of strings. So it's a ten strings. <laughs> it's really good with slide. Oh, sure. And what is the marquetry on that back strip? Is that style twenty-eight? That's a D. Yeah, yeah. This would have been a T twenty-eight. So, so this was my first, my first instrument, um, and I also bought a, a bicentennial guitar. Uh, they let me actually buy two guitars in the, that first year, which was not wow. normal. So the bicentennial guitar I, I eventually sold to my brother, huh. 
who really wanted it. I, I still get people writing me about those guitars that ended up with their uncles or ended up with one oh, wow. and want to know about it. Because mm -hmm. they don't know, you know, they've seen a Martin with stars on it, you know, and, yeah, really. and the eagle, the eagle right. headstock. Thirteen stars and the, and the eagle, yeah. Huh. Okay, so uh, my job was draftsman, and, and uh, as draftsman I got to uh, measure and, and uh, draw and dimension all of the parts for the guitars. So from uh, every front block, dovetail block, every brace, every rosette, every size and shape, ukuleles, tenor guitars, banjo, Vega banjos, uh. Um, you know, O, double O, triple O, 12 fret, 14 fret, dreadnoughts, everything. It was such a huge um, learning experience to be able to um, learn the, the correct dimensions, Martin dimensions, for every single size and shape of guitars they made. Wow. And the other interesting thing was that the foreman would bring me parts. They'd bring me a, a, a box full of the number one brace <clears throat> or the number two back brace or the back center brace or or whatever they bring a, a top and and i i would draft it and then i would take it back to the foreman and he said well i can't i can't take those back they've been out of humidity control because my office for drafting was up in the up in the front i said what do you mean you can't you you can't use these and no we can't use those so i took them home <laughs> I took them home and I, you know, every place I've ever lived, I've had a wood shop. And, um, and I, ha I had all these parts and I started to build guitars in my basement uh, with those parts. And I, I had a girlfriend named Amy at the time and her brother found out that I was building guitars and he, he wanted to be my apprentice. Well, I didn't know hardly anything at that point. But I, I said, okay, and, and his name was Jay Black. Well, Jay Black uh, uh, built guitars with me, and he was especially interested in lacquering, which was good because I didn't have a lacquering set up, and he did. Uh -huh. And uh, we built guitars together for about a year, and then off he went, uh, uh, ending, ending up eventually at Fender Guitars, and he became one of the, one of the, the top people at the Fender Custom Shop. And now he, he operates J. Black Custom Guitars oh, really? up in Oregon, and his guitars are uh, kind of electric guitars on steroids and, and uh, very, very sought after. He sells exclusively uh, to Japan, wow. all his entire, his entire output. And, and you and, taught him everything you well, knew. Well, I, I actually... Everything you knew. <laughs> I played a part in his evolution, and I'm very proud of that. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, about a year ago, UPS pulled up and, and with two guitar cartons, and I said, "What's this?" I didn't order anything, and 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 uh, Jay had made me a, a beautiful custom Stratocaster and a beautiful Tele. Whoa! And uh, and and opened them up, and it said, "Thanks for the inspiration really? and for getting me started in in this business." And you know, so. That's that's one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Right, that's amazing. Good karma. Yep. That's one thing I have to say. Good karma is Dick's middle names <laughs> um, for many reasons. Well, it's it's all selfish because uh, uh, I'm an outgoing person. I, I enjoy people. I love woodworking. I love music. I love every aspect of what what this is about, and um, so I'm the lucky one. That's very cool. I was going to say I'm the lucky one, but I think you're right. You are. <laughs> so when did you get out of drafting, and, and how did you work your way all the way up to uh, ultimately the uh, artist, artist signature models? And the well, art? well. So about, uh, about six months into the drafting, and I was really going to town with the draftings, about six months in, they hired an uh, engineer. They came up from Philadelphia from, uh, um, uh, I guess he, he had been an a engineer for a lipstick, like Revlon or something. Um, the story was that he, he engineered the, the lipstick container with male threads on both parts. So oh. 
So they were, and they ordered like a ton of them and they didn't fit together and they fired him. And, and he had a friend who was a personnel manager at Martin, got hired and came up and he was my boss. And I'm not gonna mention his name, but uh, it wasn't a good situation. I, I had had free reign up until to that point and he started giving me orders and he didn't know anything about guitars. In fact, uh, I was working on a drafting of a, a bass guitar fingerboard um, for what would become the EB-18 basses. And he came up and looked over my, my shoulder and, and said something about a, a bass guitar. He, he didn't know what a bass guitar was, but he, he did know bass fishing. <laughs> and I, I went around the shop and I said, he doesn't, he doesn't know what a, what a, bass, a bass guitar is. He thinks they're bass guitars. Don't anybody tell him. Let's see how <laughs> let's see how long we could. And, and so, but the problem was one day I was working on a drawing. Oops, it's That's for him. you. That's him. <laughs> one day I was uh, working on a, a a drafting of a, a notched tension hoop. That's the the ring of a banjo that has the notches that hold the. The, the hooks. Okay. And this is a piece of brass, uh, straight brass, which is bent into a ring, brazed, and then spun on a lathe, and then machined with the notch where the fingerboard comes in, and then no, machined where the notch where the tailpiece rests, oh. and then the notches are put in, and then it's sent out for planing. Well, we had a purchase order for, uh, I think, 300 of these. You know, they're, and they're not cheap parts. Mm -hmm. They have to be uh, polished and plated and everything. And he's looking over my shoulder and he said, uh, the braze joint, why do you have the braze joint under the tailpiece like that? And I said, well, that's so that it's hidden. And he said, that's the wrong place. And he, and, and I argued with him. He, he said, it, it ha you have to move it over to where the notch is. Well, the notch was very thin yeah. there. And uh, uh, I said, if you, if you do that, they're gonna break. Well, he, he said, no, no, they're not. And, and he ordered me to do it and he had a purchase the purchase order and I finished the drawing and he sent the drawing off with the purchase order. And um, I was so upset, I went to personnel the next day. Turns out personnel was his buddy, his fishing buddy. And, uh, I, and he put his arm around me, he said, thanks for your loyalty, Dick. Um, and the next morning I was fired. I came into work, wow. uh, <laughs> you know, my boss, this guy the, um, that made me change the drawings had an empty box and he said, pack your things, you're fired. Nobody goes over my head. Wow. So I was, I was devastated and I was, I was fired and, and, um, um, so, um, during that time period, I started work, well, while I was fired, I started work on the drawing of the D-28 uh, that everybody knows yeah, with, yeah. The, with the eagles and everything. And, and I, finished, I finished the drawing and I uh, had it published and I framed a print, the first print, and I took it out to Martin and, and, and I said, this is a gift for Mr. Martin, huh. C CF the third. He had taken a liking to me um, so he actually came out and, and you know, he was elderly and, and, he, and he, like in his eighties and he said, haven't seen you around. And I said, oh, Mr. Martin, I, I was fired. And he said, well, that's not right. And, <laughs> and, uh, um, so the next day I got a phone call, uh, from quality control from John Arndt and, um, John and I had been good friends and, and uh, John said, Mr. Martin wants you to come back to work. So that was three months that I was fired. So I came back to work and, and um, a couple of weeks later, Mr. Martin's coming down one way, down one aisle and the quality control fellow, John Art was coming this way and I was, it was right by my office and there was a, a big box that had arrived and, and uh, or that was set there and we opened it up and it was 40 or 50 broken banjo hoops. 
And Mr. Martin says, well, what's this? <laughs> and, and, and John Art said, well, those are the banjo hoops that Dick Boak got fired over. So uh, Mr. Martin said, well, that's not right. <laughs> and justice be served, the very next day, uh, the, the fellow that fired me was packing his, yeah. his box and he was out of there. <laughs> so that was uh, really uh, a nice thing. And nobody's in Satisfying. today. <laughs> right, right. Wow. That's crazy, though. So, um, in fact, the, the drafting part of the job really w uh, was coming to an end because I would pretty much completed everything. And they gave me the job of uh, running the 1833 shop, which didn't exist. It only existed in the form of a small mail order uh, flyer that was... Uh, uh, handed out at the front desk. Can you just explain what the 1833 shop was? Okay, so the 1833 shop is a, uh, was a, uh, uh, initially a way to order uh, belt buckles, uh, t-shirts, uh, a copy of Mike Longworth's book, uh, and a couple other little doodads, not very many items. Um, but it was starting to take off a little bit, and they thought that, that they could allocate a part of um, the front area by the by where the museum was, so I opened a, a an actual physical shop, and they gave me pretty much free reign. So I, I took each category uh, and expanded upon them. So guitar accessories, I started carrying capos and picks and polish and every and everything, and strings all all different the all all the different guitar strings, and then books we had books on guitar making and, and uh, uh, historical uh, books about instrument making, and the, the memorabilia of the t-shirts, and we expanded it into beach towels and jackets and all kinds of yeah. products. And, 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 um, and then, um, because of my dumpster diving, I thought, well, uh, we could sell guitar kits. Well, this was a little bit controversial because the sales department didn't like that idea. They didn't want uh, uh, guitar kits competing with the sale of Martin guitars. Mm -hmm. And I, my position was that there's no competing. It's very difficult to build a guitar. The guitars are not going to be anywhere close to Martin in quality. And if anything, all it will do is uh, recover money from our scraps and increase the esteem that people have for Martin guitars because they realize <laughs> how complicated and how difficult it is to make an instrument. Here, you try it. So uh, finally, uh, Frank Martin, Chris Martin's father and CF's son, uh, gave me the green light and we started selling uh, kits. And we also had the sawmill. And after the kits took off, I started selling uh, lumber and sawn veneers from the sawmill. Oh. Uh, which carried close to 55 different species of wood. Wow. So, so the 1833 shop expanded tremendously, and uh, uh, sales uh, doubled and tripled and quadrupled, and um, the amount of space that I had was simply too small. And so I split the store into two parts, one for uh, Sycamore Street, which was... Uh, really the memorabilia and guitar related accessories. And then the kits and the lumber uh, were moved over to North Street. And I moved with them and started the store called uh, Woodworker's Dream. So uh, you mentioned Sycamore, and that's where the modern factory is. Right. North Street is the old factory in downtown Nazareth. A beautiful historic building. And the problem with North Street was that after, after production moved out of North Street, to Sycamore Street in 1964. The old North Street building was mothballed, more or less. But the insurance, uh, the insurance policy seemed to um, require that somebody be in the building. Well, one person couldn't be in the building alone. Two people had to be there. So when I moved over to North Street and set up uh, Woodworker's Dream, I hired a, an, an, an assistant and uh, uh, the building kind of came back to life. And it was really, really great to have that building uh, opened up again because so much, so much history happened there. 
Absolutely. And um, so that opened the North Street factory, which has been, been used for multiple reasons, guitar player connection or guitar mm -hmm. maker connection. Right. And um, so what year are we talking about at the time this opened about? Oh, um, it has to be late 70s, early 80s. I think the grand opening of Woodworker's Dream might have been in 1981. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was quite an event. Uh, Grit Laskin came down from Canada and played bagpipes, and no. <laughs> and and uh, you know uh, all the Martin employees were there. Mr. Martin was there, and and it was it was great. Oh wow, it was great. Well, you one time gave a talk to a bunch of us uh, that went to the event we call Martin Fest about your relationship with with CF the yeah. third, and um, and how much that meant to you, and how much you meant to him. Well. We we uh, we really hit it off. He he liked me, and uh, and I certainly loved him. He he um, he was the epitome of integrity, and uh, integrity is not something that you wish upon yourself. It's it's bestowed upon you. And uh, he uh, he was elderly and couldn't drive to work anymore, and asked if I would uh, drive him. And it was kind of like driving Miss Daisy or something. Sure. But I would, I would go uh, pick him up and, and take him to work and back. And also, he invited me to join the Lions Club. Um, I didn't really, I, I wasn't really the Lions Club type. But I, asked, I actually asked uh, a couple of people at Martin and, uh, what I should do. And they said, if he asked you to join the Lions Club, you should join the Lions <laughs> Club. So I did, and, and I drove him to the Lions Club meetings on Tuesday nights, every other Tuesday. Yeah. And, and, and in the car, uh, uh, the car, car rides were a special time because I would ask him questions and he'd tell me about the 1920s or about his father uh, or his grandfather, or, you know, how, what, what it was like to, uh, for the guitars to be made and wow. how it was in the shop and difficulty times during the war and, you know, everything. It was just... Uh, Fantastic to have that time with him. And for people who don't know, um, his father, Frank Henry, was quite the innovator, even though he was relatively conservative dresser. Uh, he was the Mr. Martin at the time that the first dreadnought and the first orchestra model. But Fred, his son, actually had a lot to do with running the co uh, company during the golden era and into World War II, even though his father was still the head guy, yeah. Yeah. the younger son. By the time you get into the Second World War, Fred was, was the Mr. Martin that was really doing this. Yeah. So you have a link to Martin's golden era, a direct link that a lot of people don't, uh, I think, appreciate these days because they don't quite think back far enough to, you know, what were, what were his decades? And they yeah. were the important yeah. decades. Well, uh, CF was actually pretty adept at, at uh, playing. Um, he played he played guitar pretty well, and and uh, he actually had a group, a small group, uh, with his younger his younger brother, um, Herbert Keller Martin, who played mandolin, and and the, and the two of them both went to Princeton together. They were very proud of that. The younger brother passed away. Uh, um, I, I always get confused to the the exact reason of something. Uh, a very curable disease now. I think it might have been like periodontitis. I think that's exactly like, what it was, something to yeah, that, yeah, something like that. And that was tragic because, because Herbert was actually slated to take over the business. CF was interested in mathematics and probably wasn't going to stick with the, huh. with the business. But after his, his younger brother died, he, he um, rose to the challenge and, and uh, stayed with the, the company and and until he passed away in 1986, um, and um, yeah, he uh, quite a legacy. So, so that was special special time to have with him. I'll bet. So, when did you start? Um, about this, about that time, or a little after that, your name started getting known. Uh, outside of the factory walls. When did it really take off in terms of, I think it really, for us, it took off when it came to you working with artists yeah. because Martin had never done that before. They had never done an artist 
yeah. model before. Well, what happened was uh, um, um, a job opening came up uh, in the advertising department. We, we had had a advertising firm uh, that was charging Martin a, f a small fortune um, to do pretty bad advertising. <laughs> And I and with my art background, I always aspired to to be involved with that. And so uh, uh, I made it very known that I was interested in in uh, bringing advertising in house and starting an advertising department. They kind of compromised with me, and they brought me in as the coordinator to work with the agency. Um, I did that for a, a, a while, and eventually I fired them. Uh -huh. and, and brought the, the uh, ad agency in-house. And so I was running advertising. I, I got in a, a, a couple of assistants uh, over the years. And um, uh, during that time, Eric Clapton appeared on MTV Unplugged. I think it was 1992. Uh, he, he appeared on Unplugged. Um, and uh, he was playing... One of, the, one of the primary guitars he was playing was a 1939 Triple O 42, and everybody was asking me, what is he playing? Well, I did a little research, and I actually contacted his management in London, and, 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 uh, um, and I went to Chris Martin, and, and I said, there's a lot of interest in, in uh, Clapton's guitar. And uh, right around this time, uh, Chris had been out at the NAMM show and had gone to um, um, the Gene Autry Museum of Western Heritage um, and seen Gene Autry's very first D45. And Chris came back with an idea of replicating uh, the instrument. And Gene Autry was still living at the time and, and, and had said, well, that's just fine as long as you pay a royalty to a charitable royalty to the museum, a nonprofit. So, uh, so concurrently, the the Gene Autry project was uh, thrown in, into my lap uh, to design the fingerboard to match the original with Gene's yeah. uh, script name in the fingerboard, and and also this idea that I had had about contacting Clapton's management for for a limited edition. Which I, which I did with Chris's blessing. And Eric came back uh, very quickly, uh, f feeling very positive about it, mm. uh, especially because, because there was a charitable aspect which would pay a royalty to the Eric, Clap Eric Clapton Charitable Trust for, for children's safety issues. Mm. Um, so uh, this charitable aspect was a key uh, part of the whole signature model uh, uh, thing from the very beginning. Chris didn't like the idea of paying musicians to, to endorse your product. Yeah. He didn't really like endorsements in general. And his, but gran he, and his granddad would never allow He would never him. allow that. Yeah, yeah we didn't, uh, up until that point, we didn't really deal directly with musicians at all. If somebody, as a matter of fact, there was a story about Bob Dylan uh, calling the factory and wanting to come and get a guitar and they, they told him, no, you can't. <laughs> and they sent him to a dealership. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, it, w it, was, uh, it was something that we didn't do. I thought that was wrong. And, uh, uh, and I was able to turn that around as a result of the, the lim limited edition projects. We started uh, dealing directly with musicians and, and paying tribute to the musicians that, that uh, Used Martin, Martin guitars kind of voluntarily, yeah. and uh, and we had um, um, close more than a hundred different signature editions uh, with I think the the key artists of our century really. And I think one of the things that a lot of people forget about is this was a time where the Martins in stock catalog models were still relatively conservative. And the signature models allowed uh, experimentation with woods they would normally use in combinations with trim, with the, some of the beautiful inlay work that right. was done that really expanded what yeah. people were allowed to 
have on a Martin guitar. Well, in fact, we had come out of uh, a time period where Frank uh, Herbert Martin, CF the third son, uh, really wanted to focus on D18s, D28s, and D35s, and nothing else. And because that was the bread and butter. Um, and uh, Martin was, was not making O, double O, or triple O guitars or OMs. And, um, and forget about V necks and, and oh, yeah, and, uh, vintage trim and very limited, no ukulele, you know, the ukuleles weren't, weren't uh, in part of the line. And, and so um, the signature model uh, uh, projects enabled us to uh, dig deep into Martin's heritage and all the all of the forms and patterns that were stored over at North Street gradually uh -huh. made their way back and got modernized and 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 all of those uh, fantastic sizes and shapes got reintrodu reintroduced either as limited editions and then eventually became part of the um, vintage series and and the authentics and golden areas wow. and and much of this uh, uh, Chris Martin deserves a, uh, a lot of credit for because he was uh, open-minded and willing to um, take these steps to restore the heritage. And you guys are contemporaries. I've seen photos with both of you young guys with afros, yes. basically. <laughs> so, um. <laughs> And I'll go so far as to say, excuse me, I don't, it might make you uncomfortable, but you might agree with me because we say it all the time. When you think of Martin, that's the name you think of, but the other name you think of is Boke. And <laughs> that's I don't, very true. I don't right? need to put you on the spot. I, remember I, that. I mean, how many stories do we all tell if you don't use the word Martin? Your name is the one that you use, and it's, it's been threaded there. Well, that you know, that's flattering, and and uh, I, like I said, I feel lucky to have uh, uh, played uh, a, a fairly key role. Um, and once again, Chris gave me a, lo a very long leash to be able to do that, and so I'm, I'm uh, ap appreciative with him. Um, it's now been five years since I retired, okay. and and I feel that that the longer uh, that time uh, gap uh, becomes between my retirement and now, that that uh, the, the less people really are thinking about uh, my contributions to Martin, but. I'm still very uh, indebted and loyal to the company and uh, still very involved in my passion for guitars, as is evidenced in this room. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Well, in terms of how Dick uh, finished up his career at Martin, you are also something that a lot of people are going to owe you a great debt to, whether they know or not. Toward the end of his career, he got involved with the archives and the museum, and uh, people will have a, a long debt to Dick Boke because of the secrets that were unlocked out of the archives during your tenure there as archivist and, and, uh, and also the modern museum. He mentioned the museum early on, back when he started the 1833 shop. At those days, the museum was basically a long broom closet with a tiny mm -hmm. little hallway and some little cases. Yeah. It's not this amazing collection of Martins that have been acquired from all over the world to, to uh, be preserved for future generations. And you, um, we all owe you a big debt of thanks for your work in, in both of those areas. Well, let's see. So um, what happened is uh, Martin hired a new uh, director of advertising her name was Amani Duncan, and she came in and, and uh, you know, uh, she had a vision for what she wanted to do, and, and uh, she wanted to be involved with artist relations. Well, uh, so she kind of took that off my plate, and um, she said, well, why don't you focus on the mu museum and the archives? At first, this uh, didn't sit very well with me because I was very invested in artist relations. But um, uh, it didn't take me very long to realize that I was uh, coming uh, uh, closer to retirement and that this might be a really nice transition for me uh, to uh, really take over uh, uh, since Mike Longworth had uh, left the company and subsequently passed away. There was, I was the de facto person to take over the history uh, and 
the museum and the archives. So there really weren't any archives. Martin expanded uh, uh, a f the factory and built a, sp a new space for a museum. Um, so there was this vast new area that would eventually become what the museum is today. And concurrently, I requested a, a room about the size of this living room uh, that would be the archive room with uh, sliding ar uh, racks and archival um, acid-free everything. Except that instead of the moldy cardboard boxes right, in the right. attic at North Street. Yeah, so, so <laughs> it turns out that uh, pieces of the archives were stored in different places, some in, in, in the garage uh, over at North Street, some in the attic, uh, some in, in the long uh, warehouse area uh, over at North Street on the first floor, some down at the sawmill in the cage. Um, some, there was two safes at the company, one on the second floor, one on the first floor. They had the old journals in them. So what I did is uh, I created a, a space uh, where everything could be brought together in, into one area. And the interesting thing is that many of these things had never really even been looked at, uh, let alone analyzed or wow. anything. So, you know, certainly Mike Longworth uh, um, was the one that initiated uh, his history book. He, uh, he had looked at some of the older uh, journals and things to get the production numbers. But um, it was really great to have everything in one place. And uh, I should mention Greg Hutton. Uh, fairly early on in my work in the archives, Greg uh, came on, on behest of Peter Zego, who was working on a book uh, about C.F. Martin Sr. And, and the early uh, period of Martin guitars. Um, also, Philip Gura was working on a book. But Greg Hutton came and, and did uh, archive research that um, um, really continued uh, past CF Senior into CF Junior's time period, into CF uh, CF the Third all the way up to really a cutoff point of 1964 when when Martin moved from North Street. So uh, the archives really benefited from the from the work that uh, uh, Greg Hutton and other researchers and authors had done including Richard Johnston and Jim Washburn, oh. Philip Gura, Greg Hutton, uh, Woody, John Woodland, huh. um, and I'm probably missing uh, uh, several others. But they, you know, for guitar geeks, Martin guitar geeks, the discoveries that were made, whether it was Woody or Greg or in between, that stuff they discovered, like the, what's now on the uh, authentic series models, the, right. the, the old-fashioned finish, they found the letters, the actual formula for the finish that was used on style 28 and 18 guitars and that was different than the gloss that was used in the 40s. People, old timers used to remember that and people didn't know if it was myth or not. Um, the original OM with the co correspondence with Perry uh, Bechtel. Mm -hmm. I mean, all this stuff, the, the uh, Major Kielaki right. guitar that they right. didn't even know it existed that we know right. now is the yeah. or dreadnought, as it were. Huh. All of that came out of this work. and. Um, let alone tens of thousands of correspondence letters between Gene Autry and Jimmy Rogers and, oh. and, and you know, uh, just an incredible trove of information. So then you retire after the Dick Boak guitar, the uh, D. Boak, <laughs> that has a, a, a top that he did. A lot of people don't, may not know that Dick is a pointless artist who does very intricate point, pointless artwork and... Uh, and he created this amazing top that shows the X bracing as if you're seeing through the top, but also has the North Street factory and, and embellished with, with all kinds of artwork on it. But um, so you retired and, the, and you didn't say the last thing I want to do is have anything to do with guitars. You kind of did the opposite. <laughs> so, well, actually, we should mention Boke Bash and, and the last schmaltz. Oh, yes. Because um, I didn't want to... You know, most of the people that re retire from Martin, uh, they have a, a dinner over at uh, the Candlelight Inn, which is uh, they get the sterno uh, uh, and the you know the uh, yep. assembly line food. And I, 
that wasn't my idea of the, the right way to retire. So I, I wanted to have a concert and, and, um, um, and I figured uh, given my uh, friendship with many of the different artists that I could uh, invite some pretty key players. Uh, so the concert uh, featured Steve Miller of Steve Miller Band. Um, I'm trying to think, Craig Thatcher who had been very involved locally uh, as our kind of uh, guitar clinician. I'm trying to think of all the people. Lawrence. That's Lawrence Juber, uh, formerly of Paul McCartney's band Wings. Um, was was Jorma? Jorma. Jorma Kalkinen of Hot Tuna. Um, John Mayer. John Mayer, yeah. Yes. It, uh, it was... My it, favorite story about that is the John Mayer D45 had just come out. And so Martin proudly put the new John Mayer D, uh, D45, there wasn't even stores yet, on stage. And Mayer came out, played solo, and played the entire night, played Dick's. OM John Mayer, if I remember. OM no, it, it, my, I, I own the very first OM 28V prototype. Oh, it was because he used it to own is, a, is my, OM 28V. It's my oh, oh. specific uh, prototype, and it's really a good, it's really a I'm very, sure very it good is. guitar. It's guitar ever. Yeah, and it, <laughs> and it has a pickup, has a pickup yeah. in it. And, and it's the best guitar ever. It's pretty good. <laughs> oh, because I was like in the, I was... Well, I went in the second row. I was in the second row that, of the people that weren't the people. But, uh, but um, I didn't realize that. I thought it, he was playing his mayor oh, nope, signature it was, model. It was oh, the, oh wow. But I knew it was your guitar. guitar. It was my personal guitar. It was your and, personal guitar. And uh, so that was, that was wonderful. That was a really, really great way to, uh, to kind of wrap it up. Um, and, and for people that are interested, if you... Uh, if you Google Dick Boke Martin guitar or, or go on YouTube and, and, uh, and search for Boke Bash, uh, you can uh, pull up the finale uh, and some of the, some of the keys, key sets of, of that evening, which were very special. And I have one video of uh, Mayer doing, uh, um, what's that called, Gold to California. I can't remember that song off the top of my head right now. Queen of California yeah. that I snuck and is on there. <laughs> and one person that was supposed to be there, not one person, but, uh, but of course, uh, Marty Stewart and his band were supposed to be there and they got snowed in. So they didn't make the first one. Right. Then they made the sequel. Right. We, we held a second Boke Bash just so Marty could come up and, and uh, uh, do his thing with the uh, fabulous superlatives. And that was pretty special too. So... Because I had run the Sawmill and, and Woodworker's Dream, and which eventually became Guitar Maker's Connection, uh, over the years, especially um, with my involvement in the Sawmill and, and marketing some 55 different species of wood, I was always very, very interested in uh, the, the, the effect of different tone woods for back and side wood on acoustic guitars. So I started uh, saving up sets of ebony, paduke, cocobolo, uh, uh, lacewood, uh, di you know, different, um, different potential tone woods, zero uh, Honduras rosewood. Um, and I had a little stack about, about like this of, of wood that I had saved personally for my retirement, thinking that uh, maybe Maybe I would return to uh, guitar making in my retirement. Well, that wood sat uh, uh, for probably a year in my basement until the pandemic hit, and um, and I, I started building. And, I, and the very first guitar, it's right there behind you, is the uh, Honduras Rosewood uh, Allow me. fancy guitar. And there's a story here. It's heavy. <laughs> wow. So there's a bunch of things I want to say about this. The first of which is the pickguard. The pickguard is uh, uh, from a drawing that I had done some 25 years ago uh, with the intent of, of it being used on Martin's uh, laser machine. Martin had just acquired the very first of the laser machines, and they have several now. And my idea was that they would take the, the tortoise color pick guards and laser etch uh, this drawing into them. Very intricate uh, branch, branches, yeah. uh, botanical. Yeah. Um, 
so I was proud of the drawing, but they they uh, they put it on the laser machine. They put the the tortoise material in there, and uh, turned the machine on, and the the material blew up because <laughs> Picard material is basically made of uh, uh, nitrate, which is quite quite flammable. flammable. Yeah. So the safety manager came over and he said, "No more Picards for you." <laughs> so th so I put the drawing away. I put the drawing away for some twenty five years, and I saw it in my portfolio one day. This is about a year and a half ago, and I said, that, "That's a shame that it never got used." So I pulled it out and I I sent the drawing digitally down to Pearlworks, which is one of the vendors that, that furnishes Pearl Inlay. They thought it was great. And they, they wanted to tackle uh, offering it as a, or, or digitizing it for, for a, a Pearl Inlay pit guard. They made one uh, sample of it and asked if I would show it to Martin. I showed it to Chris and he said, that's fantastic. Uh, so we'll do an edition of 100 guitars. So I got to keep the prototype, and I built this guitar uh, to feature it. Chris also asked whether or not I could design uh, inlays for the fingerboard and the head plate to go along with the pick guard. And, and so Martin has, has issued uh, basically a replica of these patterns as the D42 Special. And... Uh, it's, it's a wonderful project that I'm really proud of. This guitar is made of Honduras rosewood, wow. which was one of the sets that I saved for my retirement. Wow. And in the process of building this guitar, uh, I really uh, caught the fever again. Uh, after this guitar, I started two more. And then after those two, I started three more after that. And then two more after that. And then four more after that. And I built... 12 guitars and two ukuleles during the pandemic. And um, took a little bit of a breather. And then I decided to revisit the, uh, the, spruce, the spruce goose. Show people this. I remember years ago you telling me when I asked you about the old sawmill days and Honduras Rosewood that you would... You guys would mill Honduras rosewood for marimba makers. Right, that's right. And you had said that it was rare to find really good Honduras that was big enough to make a dreadnought. Right. But you had one set. Yeah. That, and this is it. So yeah, I finally actually, get to say, see the set. Yes, yeah, so most of the most of the uh, planks were you know five or six inches in width and and had sapwood on the edges. So, so yeah, this uh, uh, my feeling is that that Honduras rosewood is the Optimum tone wood, better better than Brazilian. Really. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a, at least two species that they call them, and one of them is really muscular like this. The other one sounds drier and doesn't have quite the. Well, this is a, a particularly thick piece. Uh, I, I should have thinned it more, perhaps. But there's the one interesting thing that I would like to mention is that there's. Um, there's two types of guitars. Uh, I call them dining room tables and potato chips. <laughs> Have we had this conversation? No. Do you have any tips? Though? This is a dining. This is a dining room table. Yeah, it uh, sure dining is. Room, it's a, this is a heavy guitar. Uh, the back and sides really uh, absorb a lot of the uh, vibrations of the top and flavor them. Mm -hmm. And and if. If you can imagine putting an auto harp on a dining room table and strumming it and having the vibrations of the auto harp being oh. absorbed by the table and, and kind of enhancing the woodiness of the sound, oh. that's what I refer to as a dining room table type of guitar. The other type of guitar would be the very, very lightweight, like a, like a really lightweight D18 or the spruce guitars that I've been working on or perhaps cypress or other woods that are very, very light in weight, where you pick the guitar up uh, and it feels like there's nothing there. Uh, those guitars have an airiness and a breathiness that is the opposite of the dining room table type of thing, but they, they can be uh, m even more remarkable. Yeah, than, beautiful in their own, in their own right. right. But very, this is a 
grizzly bear of a guitar, but a very, very beautiful grizzly bear. Also, I think uh, Honduras wood, rosewood tends to have, it tends to have greater acceleration. Coco Bolo and those, they take a long time for the harmonics to swell. Yeah. And in uh, Honduras, they just, there are yet, and they just, they're very, it's, it's a much more ethereal kind of thing, even though you have that big, beefy bottom end. Gorgeous. Well, to, to briefly visit the Musser story, Musser is the maker of uh, the marimba bars. And when I was running the sawmill, we were cutting Honduras rosewood logs for Musser, and they would cut them into uh, two inch by five eighths inch uh, strips for the marimba bars. And one of their guys came with a suitcase, and he had, he had marimba bars, they were all tuned to the same note, but he had them in all the different species. Uh, he had uh, African ebony, Macassar ebony, East Indian rosewood, Brazilian rosewood, Honduras rosewood, uh, he had, you know, mahogany and koa and different, different species, and, and he had a little setup, and he'd say, listen to this, and he'd put the Indian rosewood on, and bing, and it had a nice sound. The ebony had a nice sound. Uh, he put the Honduras rosewood on there, and it was, bing. It was just, there was no, no comparison. And I said, I just don't understand. And he said, well, Honduras rosewood, something magical about the tonal quality of Honduras Rosewood. So that's why I subscribe to it and, and think it's a, a fantastic choice if you can find big enough pieces. Well, I feel very lucky to have seen this. You know, I've heard the story and of course I've seen the D42 special, but right. to see the, the prototype as it were, the yeah. Dick Boat built prototype. Well, the D42 special is uh, made with East Indian Rosewood, of course, and uh, not Honduras. And it's a, it is a beautiful guitar, and there's a limited edition of 100 of them. And I'm uh, very proud I have uh, one of those. And uh, um, they're beautiful guitars. But how does that compare to Spruce Goose, though? Well, the Spruce Goose, you know, I don't really, I was trying to figure out where this idea came from, and I guess uh, we should credit Howard Hughes, where credit <laughs> is due. You know, I always... Uh, I always liked the idea of uh, a building an all spruce guitar, and, and I think it was 1990 that I built um, that I built two. I, I think I started by building one up at Peter's Valley, which which I was teaching a course in guitar making, and I just decided I'm going to build build one of these, and it was a, a pretty big success. I I ended up building two more. And then Martin saw that I was doing it, and I convinced Martin to build, I think, four. I, d I don't know where they all went. I know Martin still has one or two in their museum collection. I have one. Matty Umanoff bought at least two of them, and I think he might have bought three and sold a couple. So um, um, I, have, I had one here and decided that I would revisit it and uh, started building um, a six-string standard dreadnought and a six-string baritone. There's a story there. I didn't really intend to build a baritone. It's just I cut the neck blank wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the neck blanks came from John Hall, and he supplied me with a, a, a nice billet of solid three-inch thick sp uh, spruce, uh, Adirondack spruce. Very difficult to find a piece like that. And I made two necks. And um, um, so the result of that is, is uh, the six string and the, and the baritone that I uh, completed uh, about, oh, several months ago. And I have them strung up and, and playable now, and I'm very pleased with them. So pleased, in fact, that I started two more. Uh, the, the two that I'm building are based on uh, my love of the Norman Blake model, which is a, a triple O 14 fret body with a short scale 12 fret neck. So the impact of doing that is that the, the 12 fret neck shifts the bridge down on the body to about an equid equidistant point between the sound hole and the bottom of the guitar. And I get that from uh, uh, the Kasha 
guitars that had radial bracing and, and uh, certainly from the Norman Blake model that had that. Uh, most, most guitars, including almost all the Martins, the bridge is perhaps two-fifths of the way from the sound hole to the bottom of the guitar, and that's certainly a fine place for it to be. I just like the idea of having it be in the middle. So if we call it the Blake design, as it were, um, but the X-brace is not moving at all, the X-brace stays where it is, so you have a greater distance between the X-brace, or does the X-brace shift as well? Well, certainly the bridge plate needs to be <laughs> under the it has bridge. has to come down, yeah. Uh, uh, it's, pr it's fine to have plenty of space between the, the X and the bridge plate, but um, I, I like, you know, I can't explain to you what I do. I don't, uh, I do this intuitively. Uh, I don't, um, when I'm laying out the bracing pattern, I just make it the way I think it should be. And if, if, if you ask me to describe what I did, I don't think I could tell you. So, well, on the Norman Blakes, did they, was it like super forward shifted? It, it was, it, it was changed, the, the bracing pattern was changed a little bit. Oh, okay. I don't think it's I never thought to it's, ask it's, that. It's not really significant. Yeah. Hmm. But yours might be more significant than the Martin version of it. Yeah, and I, uh, I think it's possible to build a, an excellent guitar uh, with, there's so many options, you know, and I think a guitar can come out great if it's moved this way or this way, or or if things change, as long as you're uh, employing all of, all that you know, uh, uh, I've been around guitars for fifty plus years, and and um, I know a lot about them. Um, I'm not sure that I can justify what I do to anybody, but but when I'm when I'm building. I just use what I know. And they, uh, I've had good results. People say, well, what's it going to sound like? I, I could tell you that it's going to sound good before the, before the body's even assembled, yeah. you know? Well, you told me a story about Fred Martin. Oh, I'm sorry, it wasn't you. Somebody else, I think, told me a story of Fred Martin when they were first trying to make the, the smaller dreadnought. Yeah, well, I, that was I, you, I told size you that. Seven. Yeah. And he all he had to do was look at the drawing and say, well, you're well, going to want no, to do he, that. He, he came back to the back and, he, and they were playing it and, and it had a wolf tone. It had, it, um, you know, if you take a guitar and you hum into the sound hole, ooh, there's a point when you hit a particular frequency when the, the body shudders. It's like, uh, and, uh, <laughs> Don't get technical on us, Dick. And, um, and that's the resonant frequency of the guitar. Well, the, when you strummed this little seven seven eight size dreadnought, it uh, maybe a G chord or something. I think it was a G chord. The whole guitar just shuddered, and and Mr. Martin came by and he said, uh, "Bring me the the bracing pattern." We brought him the bracing pattern. He said, "There was one tone bar," and he said, "Well, change the angle," and and we changed the angle and eliminated the problem. Wow. His father, he said his father taught him that. Oh, man. He also said that, CF said that no space greater than three inches by three inches should be unsupported by a brace. Really? Yep. That's why the little side braces are there. Yeah, wow. He said his father taught him that, too. Wow. And the tone bar placement across the uh, bottom bout, that whole thing. Yeah, that, uh, that's uh, operating like a hinge. So we are uh, going to be finishing up the podcast portion of this, but we're also doing uh, a video version that some of you are already watching, and that includes footage from Dick's workshop and, and the, uh, the spruce guitars that we've been talking about. So Dick, what would you like to say in terms of introduction about, about uh, what we're going to be seeing or what you would like to show us? Well, I, I mean, I wish I could show you all the guitars I, that I've made uh, and some of the guitars that I've collected. I have a couple of special Martin guitars, of course. Um, I've got the two Aardvark models, which I, I really am excited to show you. So the, the, I, I do want to tell you the Aardvark story, and that's that, that I had a beautiful, beautiful set of Zero Cody that I had saved. Zero Cody is 
ebony colored, but has kind of a Brazilian rosewood spiderweb grain. Uh, just a gorgeous set that I'd saved for uh, 40 some years. Um, it had a, a bad crack in the book match up in, up in what I call the shoulders of the guitar. And, and the crack was enough that I didn't want to try and glue it together. So I simply traced a shape like a Weizenborn or a Renaissance guitar. I traced a shape that, that circumvented the crack, came around and then and formed the, the rest of the shape of the so guitar. So that was not, you weren't thinking about what they call the Renaissance shape that C.F. Martin made a very small number of guitars. No, I wasn't thinking about it at all. And I, I actually uh, take offense a little bit. When people when say people that. <laughs> think that that was my inspiration or that I was copying a Weizenborn. I was strictly wanting to use a piece of wood that was a beautiful piece of wood that deserved to be a guitar. Well, now you make me wonder if the Renaissance guitar that's in the Martin Museum and I, uh, uh, somebody we both know that I mentioned uh, at lunch owns one of those too. Maybe CF did the same thing. Maybe he said, oh my God, there's a crack here. I don't want to lose this wood. Maybe he, <laughs> maybe you were following in his footsteps without even realizing it. But that well, had, I, I suppose no it's possible. I had no <laughs> idea that that's why you chose to make it. That's why I did it. And then having made one and having the reaction, people reacted to it so uh, strongly. They liked it for, because of its unusualness. And, and, uh, and it sounds good. Sounds good. So, I, when I got to play it at Martin Fest last year, I yeah, wanted to take yeah. it home. So um, I, uh, having had all of the positive feedback, I, I decided that my first one with Zuricote was perhaps a little heavy, and I wondered how it would be if it was made with mahogany. So I made a second one in mahogany. And I'm, I'm pleased actually with both. They both sound great. Fantastic. Um, so the, the spruce, uh, uh, now I've made uh, four spruce gooses. You'll see the ones down in the, in the shop that are almost ready for lacquer, uh, plus the, the baritone and the standard dreadnought that, that are strung and playable. Um, so um, I was, uh, had so many guitars uh, th that I had completed and I was running out of room. I, I, I don't want to uh, advertise too much about how many guitars I have, but I decided that uh, some of them should be launched out into the world. Um, so I had built a beautiful uh, OM out of, out of a very old piece of Brazilian rosewood from the North Street attic, uh, a piece that had been rejected because it was too thin for a guitar was just about right for me, especially if I didn't do a lot of sanding to it. And, uh, and I gifted it to John Mayer. It was a really a great, great sounding guitar. I had a second one, uh, a, a triplo, a short scale triplo made with another set of Honduras rosewood that was slightly smaller. And what happened was, you know, the top of a guitar is flat and the back of the guitar has an arch. Well, the sides, when I was doing the sides, I got them f reversed and I, I bent them both as uh, treble sides. So I had uh, one side that was flat on the top and the other top, the other, the base side was arched. And then on the back, one side was flat and, and one side was arched. I, f I, I figured, I'm going to try and complete this guitar. So I had a big sheet of sandpaper on the floor and I, I did this and tried to flatten out the top somewhat. And then I tried to uh, create some kind of geometry for the back. And I went ahead and I said, well, that's good enough. And I glued the top and I glued the back and then I took a look at it. And it was like, it was like the guitar body was on LSD or something. It was like, a Frank Geary, it, if you looked at the back, it was like doing this, you know? And if you looked at the top, it was doing this. And I, I just kept going and I finished the guitar. The guitar was fabulous. <laughs> and I, and I, and I, um, I ended up having my friend Craig Thatcher try all 12 guitars that I had made. 
he said, well, you know, I like this one here. And I said, are you aware? <laughs> aware? Did you look at it? Because, you know, it's like, it's uh, a little wonky. He said, I don't care. This is the best sounding guitar of the batch. I want this one. So I gifted that one to Craig. And uh, I made one out of lace wood that was uh, particularly beautiful. The wood was great and it had uh, kind of a pecky bird's eye spruce that I had never seen anything quite like it. Bird's eye wood is usually the tree has shooters shooting out little tiny stems, uh, hundreds and hundreds of them shooting in all directions. So the spruce tree must have had that. It's a kind of a, a, a mutation of the tree. And um, that guitar, I wanted to say thanks to Jeff Daniels, who had um, voluntarily p participated in, in the film uh, Birth of a Dreadnought, which I participated in. And, and he was just such a great guitar player, such a great musician, and, and became such a great friend. So I sent him the Lacewood guitar. Wow. And, and lastly, uh, perhaps my very best friend uh, in music, period, for so many decades now, has been Steve Miller. And I wanted, I wanted to give Steve something, uh, something special. I had, I'm not a believer in three-piece backs, but I had built a guitar, um, once again, out of, out of uh, Martin Attic wood. This was too thin. Um, and it, it was just the Brazilian for the center wedge and the sides, and I can show you a picture of this. It just uh, shimmered with um, kind of a mercurochrome um, luminescence. Mm. Uh, it, hard to describe. Maybe you've seen this in Brazilian sometimes, where it just uh, seems to uh, have some kind of uh, luminous color. Well, on top of that, this D35 that I built, m m pretty standard D35 Brazilian rosewood, just had the. It was the best, uh, the best balanced sound of any of the guitars I made, and I gifted it to Steve. And uh, so I have a fabulous video of Steve uh, receiving this and, and, and playing it. So, uh, But I see him often, and, and uh, I'll get to check up on that guitar and regularly. He's a huge Martin fan. He was always, you know, especially in love with Martin guitars, even though, you know, a lot of people think he was an electric guitarist in his yeah, yeah. heyday. Yeah. Uh, very cool. Very cool. Well, Dick, this has been so fun, but you know what the music means. That's right. We're almost out of time. I want to thank you so much for hosting. Well, thank you. It's always good to pair along with you. And good to see you, bud. Why don't we, the sooner we wrap this up, the sooner we see the shop. All right. Yeah. So, from all of us at Mari's Music, thanks for listening. Hear you later. This has been a presentation of Maury's Music, your trusted source for Martin and Blue Ridge guitars. Find us online at maurysmusic.com. Music.com.